All right, I'm super glad to be here. Let's see if we can get some slides up. Uh, I'm going to be introducing the AI track a little bit. And uh, I want to make two big points here. I only have 12 minutes, so it's going to have to be fast. Does anybody know what this is? This is the first radar. So radars were very important after World War I. And they, in specific, radars had a component that was uh, pivotal to making it work which was the vacuum tube. Now, there were a lot of people that knew that vacuum tubes were extremely delicate. And what vacuum tubes do are they amplify current. They take a small current and make it big. And that's what you need for uh, a radar to work. So right after World War II, scientists got working on a solid state amplifier that wouldn't break quite as easily. And there was a, a race around the world trying to get the first solid state amplifier going. Uh, and it was actually a really exciting journey where, uh, sort of like a spy uh, TV show. I guess uh, that's how they saw themselves at least. <laughs> so this is the first transistor. And a transistor, in its essence, is just an amplifier. It takes a smaller current. If that small current comes in, it takes it and turns it into a big current. And that's why the transistor was invented. So in tying this back to machine learning, what I would like to say is that the initial idea of what transistors would be useful for was for replacing vacuum tubes and building very solid amplifiers. Now, soon after the transistor was invented and proven to work, it was uh, miniaturized. But it wasn't really until the space race and uh, when the US wanted to build integrated circuits that there was really a push to miniaturizing transistor and putting lots of them onto a single circuit board and turning it into a computer. Nobody could have imagined when the transistor was invented that it was supposed to be good for building computers. It was unfathom unfathomable at the time. And it's the same thing with machine learning right now. We are so focused on these nifty tricks and cat detectors and fraud detectors and everything that we're really missing what the long-term effect of machine learning is going to be. The second point I would like to make about machine learning is now machine learning is commoditized. That's me holding last year's version of a GPU called a P100. And it has 150,000 million transistors on one of those chips. So it's really accelerated. And it's going to be the same thing with machine learning now. My second point with machine learning and what's specific about it today is not only that we don't know what it's going to be good for, but that we do know that it's going to be good. There are two kinds of people. There are talkers and there are doers. And the people that are talking about, hold on, let's slow down and see what's going on and maybe analyze and see if this is good or not, I think it's important that they do that. In the meantime, everybody else is going to be working on this technology, and there is proof that it is going to be doing a lot of good things for everyone. We'll have a more nuanced discussion shortly. But there are two main business opportunities that are presented right now uh, from machine learning, and both of them are good. The first business opportunity that's presented is one where you take existing optimization challenges and make them better. So banks, for example, have had fraud systems for a long time. And now, with the help of uh, non-parametric models, you can make these fraud systems even better. A nice example of when I was working at a telco many years ago was that I didn't know anything about the appliances that telcos used. But I could take a lot of the variables that came out of them and apply deep learning networks to do Anomaly detection, and it had a much better uh, effect than simply setting up triggers. If this value goes over this, then trigger an alarm. And that's because the values that came out of the appliances were in the thousands. And there were relationships between these variables that weren't even explainable. So it's not that deep learning is this black box that you need to be scared of. It's that now we have the ability to model phenomena that are so complicated that it's not even easy to describe what it is you're modeling, such as society. That's the ultimate paradox, that everybody thinks that society is the easy thing to fix because that's easy to model and understand. But deep neural networks, those are difficult. The second type of business opportunity is the one I'm more excited about. This is uh, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine. And he says, the business plan of the next 10,000 startups is exactly what it's always been, plus AI. These are new types of businesses that are coming out and new, types of generating, new ways of generating value for customers. 
It's not just taking what's already good and making it marginally better. It's entirely new services. So Eric Schmidt also phrased it very nicely, which is that every huge IPO win in the next couple of years is going to be something plus AI. So some of you might imagine what this is. It's squishy. It's the inside of a person. Uh, at least it's meant to, uh, meant to be. Uh, but in specific, in this picture, there is pancreatic cancer. And you might have read for many years now that deep learning can be used to detect cancer and that kind of thing. But not all cancers are equal. Pancreatic cancer is a very difficult kind of cancer and is one that starts uh, in a very nefarious way by making small, small texture changes in, uh, inside the person that might not be detectable even by the most experienced singular person. But now with deep learning, these types of cancers are detectable. And so another thing you'll notice then is that it's not the menial jobs that are being replaced. It's also the most advanced jobs that are being replaced at the same time. And so, hold up. We have ethical questions here. We need to review and make sure, are we willing to let machines make decisions on this kind of stuff? That is on the talking side. Meanwhile, on the doing side, we have models implemented at the LA Children's Hospital right now. So ICUs have had parametric algorithms for determining the mortality rates of people that are admitted. And in specific, children have a very specific algorithm to determine how much attention they need to have immediately as soon as they get into the hospital. The old models have been very crude, but simply by replacing them with recurrent neural networks and image analysis, on historical data of uh, measurements on these children, you've, had, you've been able to have immediate, immediate tangible benefits on helping these children in the hospital. So you have to balance the discussion, where on the one hand, you really do have these tangible benefits from machine learning, and on the other hand, you have people that are concerned about it. And so I'm working in particular right now with traffic. And one of the things I'm trying to do is model how people behave in traffic in real life. Previously, we've been using, our governments and other people have been using parametric models where everybody keeps a safe distance from the person in front, uh, you use the shortest route to work, and a couple of assumptions like that. And using these algorithms, they've based enormous projects, building highways through the city, past the city, creating train stations and everything. This is everybody's effort together into building a city. But what if we could actually really model the way people behave in traffic by taking people's real driving uh, behavior and then building neural networks that imitate that so we can simulate how driving really uh, happens in a city? Well, then we could actually build smarter cities. Perhaps it's not so smart to build that highway alongside the city because it won't route traffic the way the politicians imagine it. These are the real tangible benefits that are possible with machine learning right now and that can be done. So I would like for all of you to keep in mind that while everybody's thinking about, um, what was it, one of the panelists here said that somebody might be exposed to data that is questionable. Consider the alternative that a couple of years ago, uh, two decades ago, people didn't have access to information at all, except for what the teacher at school told them. There is a nuance in all of this, and I think it's a very positive one, not a negative one. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I got into AI quite by chance. Um, I have a background of engineering and then finance, so it was nothing to do with AI. And once I organized an event, uh, a hackathon in AI, and started getting really interested in it, um, and I, I started to learn more. I started to participate at events and uh, got particularly interested in um, the bias issue in AI. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about today and presenting you some cases. Um, so the more I was digging more into the bias area, the more I was asking this question about what is the future of AI? What is the future that we are creating? And what is the future I want to create um, for our world with AI? So that's why I created Women in AI. So basically, we are a global community of women expert influencers in AI, and our mission, our main mission, is to close the gender gap. Because we have a big, drastic um, um, lack of women um, experts in this field. So, 
I want to know that um, how many of you think that there are not bias in this room? I mean, let's define first what is bias. So whenever we talk about bias, and especially bias in AI, uh, we talk about the error in decision. So meaning that um, the machines, the, uh, the algorithms, they take a decision based on some input, input data. And then based on that, they're going to uh, come up with some results. So I want to prove you um, that all of you are biased. Are you ready? So I'm not sure if the light works here well, but maybe some of you know this picture. It goes back to 2015. So let me ask you this question. How many of you see this picture in white and gold? Raise your hands. All right. OK, now how many of you see this in black and blue? Raise your hands. <laughs> More black and blue, right? Um, so the funny and incredible thing behind this example is that the same picture, we are seeing it in two totally different ways, one light, one dark. So what's happening is that uh, the human's brain is perceiving colors by filtering other colors. So some of you are filtering the dark colors, so seeing it white, and some of you are filtering it the other way around. And we are biased. So this is the truth. We should accept this. And this is why we need to have diverse teams in engineering um, teams of, in our companies who are working on the applications, because if we don't have the right data set with adjusting the biases, we're going to come up with discriminative applications. So AI is the extension of its creators. Whatever biases they have, they're going to transmit it. And what is interesting about it is that AI can magnify the biases, meaning that if you have a bias, it's not going to stay there. They're going to become monster, monster discriminative animals. Let's go with another example, which is a concrete HR example. So what happened in this case uh, done by Stanford was that they divided um, two different CVs with the same group of recruiters. And they did it actually with uh, 11,000 people. So to, um, to, the first, uh, to the first group, I mean, that they're the same, same group, to the first batch, they just uh, changed the um, name of the account. They, everything was the same. All the criteria were the same on the, on the CVs. They only changed the name of the CVs from men to women. And here's the interesting thing. The outcome of both of them was that men are the best candidates for that job. And even the recruiters were female among them. So once they were, they were saying that the excuse is, OK, the candidate is better in education, so they have you know, better educational background. And when they were saying that for the second batch, why did you choose the other candidate? And it was a man again. They were saying, no, oh, that candidate is really good you know, at experiences. They have a really hard work you know, um, background. And then when they realized that they were choosing the same people but changing their gender, they were really shocked. So this is actually what's happening with some of the algorithms that, for example, this is a personalized ad on Google. Engineers working on it basically had thought probably or um, had considered that women, they don't need to earn more money because the ads that they show to men with the higher salaries are more than women. So what happens here is that women lose the opportunity to choosing a higher salary job, apart from the stereotypes that we have in our world. This is another example. Basically, it was a test called Beauty AI. And the outcome of, of that, of the application, was that all blonde hair, blue-eyed, white women are the most beautiful. Which, if, the, if you think so, you better stay your way out of the stage after this talk. <laughs> So this is another example. It's not about gender, but it's more like global, about um, Asian faces that the Nikon, Nikon camera was considering that they are sleeping when they smile. And another really, um, like a very, very bad example of Google Photos that there was tagging um, black-skinned women and men as gorillas, which is a disaster. So this is actually something that we use it every day. Google Translate. Our children are using it. The, third, the funny thing is that um, in Turkish, also in Persian, I'm, I'm Iranian, we don't have actually um, a pr pronoun which has a gender. We say that person in Turkish is O for both he and she. 
So Google, since it's biased and is based actually on information on the internet, is considering that a doctor should be a man and a nurse should be a woman. And let's ask this question. Why are assistants, robots, most of them are female? Do you think that if we had the equal number of men and women in the domain, in the engineers, in the engineering team, did we have that many assistants who are female? I don't think so. So let's look at some statistics. Um, basically, there's a study ha uh, had been done for over uh, 12,000 women in Europe. And um, they, they basically spoke to them about their studies and their evolution in the STEM area, science, tech, engineering, mechanics. So what happens, they notice that at the age of 15, um, there is a big decrease in the number of women who want to do um, these studies. They want to continue their studies in STEM. And the interesting thing was that they were saying that there's a lack of role models and the opportunity of careers. So they asked the second question from them. They said, would you continue working or study, um, continue your studies in STEM if you had a career opportunity? 60% of them said yes. So what happens in the journey of a woman who wants to become successful in the career to become an expert in AI, let's say? If you imagine the journey as this, like when you go up, you get older, and this is the number. So you start with the, with the, you know, the seeds um, of, you know, of, our, of our talents. So when you, go, when you reach to the age of 15, 15, 16, you have, a, you have the first shrink, first churn rate. And then later on, when they want to get specialized, when they want to find a career, guess what? The recruiters are men. Um, when they actually finally survive, those actually on the top are really rare creators. So when they actually survive at the end, um, they don't really, I mean, that's the case of my co-founder, for example. She's a PhD in AI. She's expert in robotics. And she was spending all her life in laboratories. So most of the women who get actually expert in AI, they don't dare to go and speak and become role models. So those little young girls, they don't see them role models to project themselves in the future. So what we are actually doing, for, for instance, at Women in AI is we are pushing the both, um, both sides to reach to each other. So we have, for example, an educational program for young children. We're organizing one summer camp next month to help them discover AI, discover the work, the career that they can have, and actually show them role models who are inspiring so that they could see the opportunities. And then to recruiters, we're telling them that, hey, look, what's going to be the danger if you don't recruit a diverse team? And we help them to, to find you know, the talents and the data scientists that they need to, to absorb in their companies. And then we also work with events to help them with speakers. So this is actually the way that we can show those experts and making them speak out. So I want to address this last example to those women who are here. They are asking themselves if they should do engineering or if they are thinking that they are good at coding or not. And those men who are recruiters, who think, that men, who, who think that women are not as good as men in coding, well, you're wrong. Because there was a study on GitHub. I don't know how many of you know this, but this is a social network of developers. And the study showed that women had better codes, and their codes had been, um, with a higher percentage, approved by the community if they were covering their identity for all the top 10 languages. So now you should rethink. And I really like this um, sentence of Jack Ma. Um, what he's saying is that if you want your, your company operates with more wisdom, you care, uh, with care, the women are the best. Well, I think that actually we need to have, we're going to have uh, um, the need of more EQ, high potential talents. So I do believe that women have a higher EQ, and I do believe that AI and the future of AI needs more empathy, thinking about ethics, respect, and the rights of everybody as a whole. So I wanted to do this challenge, have this hashtag, YouTube badass. If you think you know a woman who's 
really badass in what they do in STEM AI? Or you think that there's a woman who should think of doing something in AI, study or do some research, starting a startup there? Write a message to them and tag them with the hashtag #YouTubeBadass. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. As usual, it's a pleasure to be here at Latitude 59. And as I keep saying every year, Latitude 59 is way better than Pioneers. So let's start with the topic of the day, which is autonomy as a service. Now, when I was here last year speaking on stage and talking to Andros later on, I said, Andros, you know, we need to demonstrate how AI is, as this uh, topic says, it's not really hype, it's reality, and how that reality is impacting us on a day-to-day -day basis. And, I, and we said, well, next time I'm here next year to speak, we'll have some drones flying around, right? Ultimately, with the construction of the stage, we can't have drones flying around, so we'll have to wait another year for that. But in the meantime, let's talk about how this reality is actually happening as we speak. How many of you read this morning about the robot hand that, is, that was flipping burgers, it was a toy, but now it has an actual job and it's paying taxes. You read that one? Yeah. It's coming to a store next to you. So let's talk about how this thing started. The, the dawn of the new era is not something new or something unexpected. It has been, in a certain sense, planned for a while, and there was a lot of discussion around that. So in the World Economic Forum, we have been talking about the Fourth Industrial Revolution for a while because Charles Schwab, the head of the forum, he was the and head of uh, uh, Davos as well, uh, is the one that actually came up with that concept, right? And so he and Jeremy Rifkin had a big discussion about who talked about third industrial rev in the revolution, the fourth industrial revolution. But in a sense, putting aside the jargon, what was predicted, and this was in 2016, is that there is a, in 2016, 900 plus experts around the world, we came together and we said, this is the dawn of the era of cyber physical systems. So it's no longer about just software and the internet, and it's also not just about hardware and robots, it's about the combination of the two that's making it possible. That was in 2016, and this is a study that you can download. In 2012, uh, the European Commission asked me, what was my vision for the future and how did I see it? And this is what I said back then, and that's the basis of what has happened now in, this, in, in terms of what we've been doing. And that is that I, I said back in 2012 that we are going to reach an a point of hyper-connected presence, where it's not going to be about Internet of Things anymore, it's not going to be about smart data or big data. Back then, 2012, it was called big data, it was called, I don't know how many of you remember that, the grid, you know, the grid computing, things like that. And AI was still a very esoteric topic. So, there was all these conversations, and I said, basically, what we're going to see is that will come together to provide a hyper-connected presence where you are always on. You're not thinking about how you're on, is it through the internet or through Wi-Fi or through the phone or whatever, you're just on, and everything around you is also on. So you are living at the same time in the physical world as you are in the cyber world. And that is what we, where we are today. And so the, in 2017, uh, one year after the forum, we had that discussion, I started the company Unmanned Life to try and work out a way of how we could do that. And that is the concept of the autonomy as a service. So in a, in a nutshell, autonomy as a service is a way to provide an autonomous workforce composed of robots, drones, robotic arms, IoT devices, without having to think about how that actually works. So just like today, if you take three or four human beings or 10 or 50 or 100 human beings, put them together and say, let's do a warehouse management, and you watch the warehouse being managed, the exact same would happen with 100 drones, rovers, and IoT devices and robotic arms without you wondering how is that happening. And that goes way beyond intelligent robots or autonomous robots or just software. That's the concept of autonomy as a service. So effectively, it ensures that from the point that you say, let something happen, to the point that it actually does happen with the robots working in a complex way, navigating together, working it out together, uh, making the decisions of how to coordinate, how not to collide, how to deliver the outcome within a certain time. All of that is managed purely through AI, through a software that's not even present on the ground. It could be somewhere on the cloud or the internet. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? But it's not. It's reality. And it is now enabling the future of urban environments. So I'm pretty sure when I come back here in a couple of years, we will see the first ride-sharing 
service that's done entirely by AI. So autonomous cars moving around, taking people to Latitude 59 from the Nordic Hotel and back, and doing that without any drivers, but also all of that being managed by an AI. We would see drones doing deliveries. We would see you would get your Amazon uh, in your home, and it will be, in fact, other companies rather than Amazon who will do that first, especially in the US. Um, and you will see other things that are today simply not available or not happening. And that's because autonomy as a service will be a part of how that is enabled. But more than that, it's also about how we think about urban environments. The idea, the concept of urban environments today is that it's entirely physical. How many of you have walked to work with a robot walking next to you? Anybody? No? Not even a starship? OK. I thought there were starships on every street here. But uh, it's not the case, right? But it will be the case. You will walk to work, and there'll be a robot walking next to you, and he, the, it, it or he or she would also go to work, right? So our idea is to enable autonomy as a service for all sectors of the economy. It is not a proprietary concept that we are trying to sort of monetize or whatever. This is about how we can transform our world into the next stage, into the future. And we started with a few sectors, but I'm not going to talk about that today because that's not important. What's important is, what is this concept? And it has now started to become a standard. It has gone on to techtarget and whatis.com. Um, and the core value proposition is that as a user, you are either a holding a device, a smartphone, or a, or a tablet, or, or a computer. And as a company or an enterprise, you're holding, you have certain systems. And from that point to the point that you have an autonomous workforce should be entirely invisible, should be done by software and AI running somewhere without you having to manage it. So for you, it should be as simple as saying, car, pick me up, which is what you do today on your apps. So for a company, it should be the same as warehouse 95, get managed, or deliver 20, these 23 parcels to these 23 destinations. And the rest should simply be done by software invisibly. And that is what will bring that revolution about. And if you look around you, many of the things we do today work on that principle. How many of you have actually opened up the Uber app and filled out specific data? You don't, right? You just point somewhere. So it has to be that simple. And autonomy as a service is about making it that simple using an architecture that anybody can follow. So we've actually gone to market on postal logistics, telco, uh, because these are the two hottest areas. But there's a lot of other things going on, uh, emerging areas that are going on. And I'm going to talk about one very specific thing which uh, affected me uh, personally. And I, I felt that if we were two years ahead, it wouldn't have happened. You must have heard about the Grenfell tragedy in the UK uh, about a few months back. And of course, we discover every day more horrible things about that, how it could be prevented. But one of the things that happens in an emergency fire rescue is that the firefighters have two huge issues. Number one, there are no communication networks because either they're overwhelmed or they have crashed. That's the first thing that crashes when there's a fire, right? Uh, I mean, it may seem like communication is happening by magic, but it's not. There's a radio outside of this building. There's a radio on the other side of this building. You may not see it, but it's here. And if that radio doesn't have power or, or, if, it's, or if the area is too hot, that radio goes offline. And then you're done with communications, which is what happened in the California forest fires. People for a week did not know what was happening to their friends or colleagues or family because nobody could get in, nobody could get out, and there was no communication whatsoever. Yeah? So that's the first thing that goes down. But then, let's say you're a firefighter and you want to enter a building. You need to know which part of the building is burning inside, which you can't see from outside which part is very hot, which part is unsafe or unstructured or about to collapse, where are the people that need to be rescued first? And this information is not available because you can't see it and you can't feel it, right? And so what I was saying, uh, and now we're talking to, to the London Mayor, we are a part of the London Mayor's program to enable that, is that you can actually deploy, using autonomy service, autonomous drones that you know, will provide an emergency ad hoc telecom network. This will be, this will be reality in this, in this uh, next six months. And then you will have drones who will use that network to send back data such as this part of the building is hotter or not, thermal imaging, where the people are, what can be done. So when a fire starts in a tall building, you don't have firefighters rushing in. The first few hours are spent in figuring out what to do. And those are the most crucial ones. And that's what leads to these horrible deaths and all of that. And I hope that this is one of the things that we will implement by next year to, to solve. And so this is just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that's possible once you move from the idea of a physical world to a cyber-physical world, where there's more than just you and physical system, there is a cyber presence that actually guides that through AI, right? 
So we've, in the, we've been here, we've started off, I mean, we started deploying since September last year. In the last six months, we've been uh, in different parts of Europe and in the US. Okay, uh, some, some people, uh, some, let's say, well-known people have recognized us for what has been done, and we're just getting started, uh, multiple awards, etc. And we've also managed to, what I think is more important uh, is that to make this reality, it cannot be a one person, one company, one thing show. This has to be something that is democratic and that is accepted and that is adopted. And that's what we're trying to do. And so we're very happy that in the last six months, a lot of companies and uh, uh, organizations have come together to support that. And that, of course, will grow in the months to come. Now, in, in order to stop boring you uh, with, my, uh, with my speech, I'm now going to switch to a video which will give you a very quick overview of what the world could look like in the next few years uh, once autonomy as a service starts happening. Now, I said that a few years ago about the burger flipping robot and its reality in about six months. So who knows how fast this will be implemented. If I could request the video, please. We're going to talk about all things AI, and with me are all the speakers that you just heard from, and we we'll also have Tavi, who is the CEO of Cypher. Um, so AI is a very broad topic, and um, we're going to cover a lot of grounds here in the next uh, 25, 30 minutes, and we we'll then open up to questions. So first off, um, all of you presented very different views, although related views, about artificial intelligence and the ecosystem. Um, tell me about your biggest challenge right now, and maybe we start with you, Tavi. I think the biggest challenge for, for AI is data, always. I mean, you've heard it today about problems with data biases. Um, th there's, there's a problem with not having enough data to train algorithms um, and, and how to get valuable data out of all this sort of big data ecosystem. So, so for me personally, uh, as a company owner, I, I, data is, is the biggest issue. Legislation is also a problem. So the European Union tomorrow launches the GDPR, which will... Is uh, everybody ready? I think everybody's GDPR. ready, right? <laughs> uh, or if not, then expect some nice fines. Um, so I think the legislation in Europe has caused a situation where we're lagging behind the US, Russia, and maybe even China. Uh, because things are a bit more lax there, so. Yeah. Okay, so data regulation, we'll circle back to both of those. What about you, Robert? I think um, lack of creativity is uh, the biggest challenge right now. Um, so I was talking with Tavi yesterday about robots, and you know, when you think about AI and robots, you think, uh, you know, maybe a robot can behave like a cat or something like that. But I had a friend who gave me an example of using AI 
to make robot motors more quiet. So you built a model that would get the move to look the same, but it would be more quiet because those engines are so loud and annoying. And I, that's the kind of creativity that I think needs to be there to break new ground, like what I was talking about, where you know, the obvious examples are obvious. It's the new, neat implementations of AI that I'm looking forward to. And I think that's people really need to squeeze their brain cells to, to try and come up with these cool new use cases for AI. And uh, Mujan, you talk about talent and the gap in talent. And you know, coincidentally, Robert just talked about creativity. So we may come back to you and talk about specific things that you guys are action on. But in bridging the gap in talent, whether it's in data science or technology in general, What's the biggest challenge that you see that the biggest champions, corporates, are not actually doing, even though they yeah. are pouring millions of dollars into these programs? Yes, yeah, so I would say the biggest challenge today is, I mean, finding the right people for, for being, um, being educated to work on the application and creating them. So when I talked about, for example, having developers um, studying about ethics, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a question that more and more we're asking ourselves that, Maybe our teams of like create, uh, developers or those engineers, they should also be more, um, be educated on different topics such as AI, ethics, and um, is, for example, what application I'm creating as a developer, is it ethical to do it? I just don't follow the instructions. So that's one of the challenges to having people who are um, educated um, on that, and then also the diversity issue. Um, I think that that's the biggest, I mean, the most important thing is to, as we mentioned it now, to, uh, to have right data sets, databases. So how we could get that? Uh, there are people who are feeding it. Um, who are those people? There are engineers who are doing it. So who are those engineers? Again and again. So you go really further into reaching to the point that you need to have right people working on it. Um, and I would say another thing that was interesting that is that uh, we're getting more and more into, for example, agents, robots, and uh, assistants. And so with the launch of Google Assistant, I think one of the biggest challenges will be how do we um, differentiate a robot, an AI, uh, and a human? So what is going to be this line, which is getting thinner and thinner? And for Kumadev, you talk about this very ambitious view where yeah. it's a hyper-connected society. You have the drones, you have... Um, you know, the end uh, points where they're all connected, transmitting data. And one of the most recent, um, you know, talks or topics is for all the autonomous vehicle companies is who set the standards for safety? Because today when people build autonomous vehicles or as one example of autonomy, uh, autonomy um, instrument is that the safety standards are created by people who are experts in that field, who understand the risk, who understand the liabilities, and be able to create a governance around that. Mm -hmm. And so in the world that you envision, um, which tie back to data and other things, um, how do you solve that problem? How do you convince your customer that, look, what you're building is not a siloed set of system, and that it will interoperate with perhaps someone else in the audience who have similar ambitious vision? No, I mean, Joyce, first of all, I think you've sort of put your finger on the most important topic in this uh, transformation phase. So, in general, when you transform, and you would know that very well with your own uh, expertise in the domain, is at the moment, any time that you transform from a scenario which is accepted by people, rightly or wrongly, i.e., a scenario that's in your comfort zone, to a new uh, scenario where things are uncertain that you haven't tried before and that you haven't actually been a part of designing, you have immediate resistance to that simply on the basis of, hey, wait a second, I'm pretty okay. You might actually be very bad, but I'm pretty okay. This is actually what Kanye tried to say on stage and he got bashed. But this is what you're trying to get to. Is that sometimes your mindset gets so accustomed to where you are that even if that is actually bad for you or that's not optimal for you, you kind of think this is the right thing to do. So when it comes to AI safety, and more than safety, as you correctly pointed out, Joyce, trust that this new world will actually function according to the kind of rules that we are used to and will safeguard the things that we think are important will be uh, is central. And there are no bullet, silver. I wish I could say these are the three bullet points that we need to do the three-point plan, and it's all going to be solved, right? But, you know, I don't believe in three-point plans. And uh, 
it's not about point plans. It's about understanding that we, are, we don't know the answers. So if somebody stands up there and says, my company is called trust.ai, and I'm going to bring trust into AI, you've got to take that with a pinch of salt. We don't know the answers. We don't know what data, security, and trust issues will happen. How so many let's talk about that. Yeah. So uh, I'm not entirely convinced by your answer. Okay. Because uh, Tavi and Robert, uh, they also work with large clients on data science pro yeah. products. And so how do you talk to your clients about, look, it's trash in, trash out in, in the world of AI where you need to actually have responsibly generated data to avoid biases, and then you have to, to have the right talent to build the right algorithms, and then you have to pick the right use cases, and then you have to pick the right implementation plan to actually execute it. So how do you guys go through that phase? Because in, in, it's interesting because you're at the forefront uh, pushing one view, right? Yeah. A view of a hyper-connected system. And on the other hand, you are working with multitude of clients who may have similar desire, and yet they don't necessarily know where to start. So it's the same transformation problem. So where do you start practically? And how do you think about those problems? Well, well first of all, if I can circle back to the trust issue very quickly. I mean, my view on the trust issue is, is very clear I mean, in the sense that I'm going to be a bit politically incorrect here. So if you take Skynet, you know, in the Terminator movie, what's the difference between Donald Trump having his hand on the button and, and a badly trained AI? So we should actually make AIs uh, sort of responsible in the same way as human beings are, and we should not ex expect them to be perfect because you know they're built by people who aren't perfect. Now, if we're talking about how, how how this comes from a customer point of view, um, it depends in, from the industry very much. So if we're talking about sort of very mission critical services like banking, in, uh, electricity, uh, you know things like that, then these tend to be very narrow AI solutions, which means that they're trained on very specific uh, data sets. Those data sets are pre-approved, and they do only one very specific thing. Will that move into a more general AI term? I, I don't know. I really like your example because <clears throat> the, thing, the difference between Donald Trump and Skynet is that Skynet can be reprogrammed fairly easily, <laughs> uh, in theory. <laughs> and I think that's the, the big thing with AI. And one of the things I tell my customers is that um, I'm not presenting them with an end game plan. Like, here it is, and once you've done this, then you're good. Exactly. Right? So you have a model, and it's going to be incremental improvement continuously into an unseen future. Yeah. So what I think AI offers us more opportunities to get rid of bias and unfairness and all that kind of stuff because it's programmable and, and can be subject to this continuous improvement over time. So, but, but what's the how, right? So we understand that you put guardrails around um, the programs that you write, you develop um, the machine learning algorithm. So how do you actually catch um, bias, right? So obviously you, you moved on, have shown examples where even Google didn't realize that, look, in Turkish, it's the same pronoun. You write the same way, but they just tend to pick the different association, uh, association bias, with a specific occupation with gender. So how do, how do you actually, so as implementers and, and frontier workers of, in AI, what is the how? How do you actually put uh, practically you know, guardrails or QA process that's different from how we do in software development today to prevent um, you know, obvious things, or maybe not obvious, but it should be obvious now because we have tons of examples of products in production. Yeah, I mean, I would just come in that first you should acknowledge it. You should acknowledge that there is a bias, there is a problem. You should understand that, okay, that's the problem, and you need to go and fix and correct it in the database. So if there's data missing there, try to you know, get the, as much as data that you can to generate a better database. Um, it is not an easy thing. Sometimes we don't know what, why something is happening. When we talk about a black box, for example, we don't know what is happening, why. We got that result, and um, that, that's the main problem today, that we, our, our knowledge and insight is not enough to understand what exactly happens in deep learning algorithms. And there is also a tricky thing that I, I came across in one article was saying, um, so sometimes we, by changing the algorithms, you can completely change the, the results and the defending yourself that you are not biased. So it is some sort of a, like, um, labeling yourself um, unbiased, like 
bias friendly or something, and that some companies can can use it. And um, it is very uh, very hard to assess the um, all these you know issue and tackle it. So um, there's I don't have an answer to say, but we need to know that there is a bias and uh, correct it. So because if you don't do it, then that bias becomes the logic of the system. So the system starts um, replicating it and magnifies the bias. Robert, what's your view on that? I think, um, well, what stands out to me, obviously, is that there's a two-pronged issue here. One is an issue of interpretability, and one is an issue of whether the model, I'm not going to say it's biased, because it could have high variance, it's just a bad model. So if you have a bad model, we already have ways of improving bad models. So I don't really see that as, a, as the main challenge. But there's another challenge, for instance, let's say you have uh, a model that's meant to tell you whether a candidate is good or not, and you notice that it always disqualifies candidates that listen to heavy metal or something like that. <laughs> and uh, you as a human, because you don't really have an intuition for Simpson's paradox or you might not understand confounding variables and that kind of thing, you might be tempted to conclude, oh, well, it's because um, he listens to metal. But it happens to be that there are confounding variables or there is some kind of statistical thing going on which can be explained by hidden hidden variables and other circumstances. And so there's a, lots of things to study there, but the model is good. It gives high accuracy on the predictions, and it's reliable. But then the question is, can, can we learn things from it? No, maybe we need to refactor it so that we can learn new things from it. So <clears throat> I think you know, this is standard praxis for the scientific method. Uh, I don't think it's a, a new kind of problem that needs to be treated in any, in any way other than what we've done before. Yeah. What's your retiree? And I, I kind of agree with that. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's always easy to blame math, but math usually is right. So, so it, it, it's, it comes down to the, actually the method and, and, and the variables, as, as Robert mentioned, uh, of, of, of what you're predicting or what, you're, what, what the sort of bias is. So, uh, yeah, but, but I actually, you know, what I want to say back to you is that you're right. It's a scientific method. It's a topic of research. And it should not be given any more importance than that into the global scale of things. So it should not be made the central decision-making factor or whether you go ahead or not. There are existing systems that are 20, 30 years old that have the same problem. Yeah? So that hasn't stopped them from being adopted or being used. And I think we need to trust here the way systems and markets work in general and not to say that until we figured out the bias problem, nothing else should happen. Right? So this is the balance that needs to happen, and I think that is exactly where today you see a lot of governments and uh, populations saying, OK, right, that problem is there, but let's not stop the world and get off it because that problem is there. And that, I think, is the right approach. Sorry, I just want to ask, actually, yeah. so you're working in smart cities. Um, yeah. you, I think you've heard about this um, case that there is a machine, a smart machine, that yeah. there are one, one part, for example, there's one important person, and the other part is a big group of people. Uh, the machine should decide which one to kill. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the ethical <laughs> question of it. Yeah. So when you get to all this, you, it's so hard to judge as a human being. And some, some people, they say that it's actually better an AI, which is a general uh, knowledge, could take that decision because we humans are already by ourselves, so we cannot really um, judge on that. I, I totally agree with that. I, I totally agree with that. I think it's... We've always thought about keep the human in the loop, and all, us here, all of us here, we're all computer scientists, right? That's our background. So as computer scientists, we've always been trained, and that's our inherent bias. Mm -hmm. As computer scientists, we've been trained to say keep the human in the loop, keep a manual override. And I think that's one of the reasons many things are failing, is that this manual override is in fact the weak link. And it is perhaps important or perhaps necessary to try and see other paradigms, which may not be perfect or might be even worse, but let's give something else a chance. Because this is not really working, is it? I think holding up humans as the bastion of intelligence, altruism, fairness, and everything is perhaps not the best. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yes, and, and actually we are moving from a, I would say, and this is what I see happening in the next two years, is we're moving from a human-to-AI interaction to an AI-to-AI AI interaction. And that's going to change a lot of things, I think. So what are some of the implications when we move to an AI to AI uh, interaction? I, I'm assuming, you know, um, it's interesting view that if you hear, but you know, when you go to Silicon Valley, you have uh, the OpenAI organization, you have others, and their mission 
right, literally are around ethics and yeah. try to understand um, what machine learning algorithms or type, you know, can generate adversarial behavior once you have released those um, applications. So I'm assuming that they're not doing this because it's just a marketing effort. Uh, maybe they're thinking about the world where the world is becoming much more instrumented in that, you know, right now maybe an AI application is 80% algorithm and 20% still human to do the last mile of the work. But in the next two years, it could be 100%. So in that world, what are some of the implications or considerations as people who are building these applications moving forward? I, I was asked this question actually yesterday evening, and, and I, I, I think what we need to do is, there was a question around ethics. You know, can we train ethics into a machine learning algorithm? Will there be a general ethics AI? Well, we don't have a general ethics code in the society. Yeah. So I think it's going to be the same, so that we'll have different parts of the society, different parts of AIs will be taught differently in terms of of ethics. What, in terms of AI to AI communication, what I see is that it's going to be initially used as a tool to make your life simple. So instead of you logging into your tax authority and doing your taxes, you'll just receive a message, hey, I did your taxes for you. Mm -hmm. And those two AIs in the background have sort of your personal assistant and the tax authority AI have communicated that in the background. Is that really AI or is that more of just expert system? for well, take individuals at, who wonder that question. I think if you take a look at what Google Duplex did with the, their personal assistant, so they created a, a uh, solution which could actually call your hair, hair salon, right? So it didn't have a back-end API integration. Mm. So w imagine if Google D Duplex calls another D Google Duplex, basically. That's what it's going to be. So it's going to make simpler connection methods more relevant again. So let's uh, talk about, as you talk about future, you said one of the things is, um, you hypothesize, or maybe it's your belief, that Europe may become uh, lagging behind because of, uh, you know, regulation, um, the ability to access data, and to drive innovation forward. Um, GDPR is uh, become active tomorrow. It, is that an observation, or that's a, a general concern for people working in the ecosystem in Europe, and why that is? What are some of the specific data points that might From my point of view, I, I did mention this, and this is just my opinion in, in that sense. I haven't seen a, a sort of a, a lack of people developing AI. I, I don't know, because of GDPR. No, no I don't not think. Because, not yet. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think, GD, and I think anyway, GDPR, look, we're in, we're in Brussels. We are deeply involved with all of this stuff. So GDPR, uh, there are a lot of myths about GDPR. One of the myths is that you have to send an email to everybody in your database asking them to click a button so that they can keep being contacted. That's not required. <coughs> if you already have consent, you don't actually have to get consent again. So there's a lot of myths about GDPR because it's very poorly understood. But yes, there has been no impact. What I think it has an impact, will have an impact on AI, is the, release, is the recent initiative of the European Parliament about how AI and ethics should be regulated. And so there has been a kind of pre-law that has been put into place in the Parliament uh, just in the last session. And uh, that talks about some of the ethical implications of AI, specifically AI versus jobs, because that's what the parliament is concerned about. And those are the kind of things that might put a chill on the development of AI in Europe. I actually also want to talk to you about the open AI thing, because we're involved in the open AI. And yeah, you might want to wonder what the exact, um, let's say, goals are of the organization overall, beyond what is stated. But I don't think that the ethics conversation should be taken off the table. I think it should be on the table, and I think most AI companies that are dealing with it should talk about that, but just not pretend they have the answers, because we don't have the answers. Let's, let's be honest, we don't have the answers to this. This is something that is going to develop as AI develops. And yes, systems will talk to each other. Alexa will talk to Alexa. Your kid's Alexa will talk to your Alexa <laughs> and figure out what time you're meeting at the tennis court. This is going to happen, right? So Your Alexa tattles on you to mom and tells that you didn't do your homework. <laughs> No, but I think it's hard to imagine that GDPR won't affect AI development in Europe in a negative way, mm -hmm. given that we're a global society. Uh, what we're competing against is people that don't have the equivalent regulation. And I guess in a sense, I would have wished that there had been an initiative on education instead, telling people, you know, if you have a private photo that's compromising, don't put it on this platform that spreads it to everyone in the world. Yeah. You know, that, that's a simple principle. But, um, you know, now it's in place. And... Um, other places don't have that same regulation, and they will be unscrupulously be collecting data 
And it's, you know, a little bit like blockchain. It is unstoppable. You know, China tried to uh, ban it, then they tried to regulate it, then they tried to ban it again, and now they're trying to become experts in it. It's going to be the same thing with AI. You can discuss how dangerous it is, but that doesn't mean it's going to stop progressing while you're discussing. It's going to keep moving forward. Yeah. So let's talk about the future, um, and then we'll open up the questions to the audience. Um, so one of the questions in my UC Berkeley data science class, actually the students asked uh, after two years of paying UC Berkeley and got a master data science degree, is <coughs> am I going to be out of job in two years? <laughs> right. So this classic question is that uh, you know they built all the algorithms and it's actually dis going to dismediate um, the data scientists because there will be data science out of box. There will be predictive algorithms as a service. And they start to see, for example, Facebook has a large profit, which is highly well-trained you know, predictive modeling. And Amazon came out with SageMaker and so forth. So what's, view, what's your view on the future of data scientists or, or folks who are experts in machine learning and so forth? I have, a, I have a really sort of good thing I usually answer whenever somebody says this, you know, will I be out of a job in two, two years? Andrew NG has this uh, saying that uh, artificial intelligence is kind of like electricity. So when electricity came in the Industrial Revolution, it changed every single industry. But that didn't mean that those, some people lost their jobs, but you know, their jobs transformed into something else. I think data science is in a similar situation because it's evolving at such a high pace, they will definitely have a job in two, two years. We just don't know what that will be yet. Okay. I don't agree. You know what I mean? <laughs> Excellent. I, I, I think the first uh, people it, of those in, in that like sphere to be replaced will be programmers. And I saw this really nice article about programming 2.0. So previously, you would have to set up this really complicated rule set that would trigger under certain circumstances and then do something based on an input. For example, uh, a bad guy in a video game. You know, if you stand here and this thing is in the way, then step like this. But in the future, that stuff won't be programmed anymore. You mm. might be able to develop models for it. So I think programmers are more at risk than data scientists. But then, now that the models are getting more and more sophisticated and can handle tasks that you would, to use psychology terms, require an IQ of 87, 89, 90, and that kind of stuff, what do you do with one-fourth of humanity? If yeah. flipping burgers is the only valuable skill they can provide to another person, what do you do with that person? How can, how can the they education. be a, you should work on the education. Yes, everybody should be a <coughs> physicist. I agree. I'm not sure it's possible. <laughs> I don't think everybody should be a physicist. I, I was exaggerating. <laughs> but, but I do think it's, it's unfair to expect that everybody has the potential to, to go beyond you know, what they're born with. I, I, don't, I can't dunk a basketball, no matter how much I practice. <laughs> no, maybe I could. But, but still, there, there are reasonable limits with that. No, so, no I agree with that. There's something about like the human brain. Do you know how, what's the percentage of the brain of the most intelligent person in the world that had, and he had used it, a 16 person, and it's Einstein. So he has been wor using his brain up to 16 point, and he became Einstein. Why, why not us? So what, when we talk about, for example, human augmentation, when we talk about the machine uh, versus human um, integration, actually machine and human integration, it's something that is going to happen. So it is going to also change the uh, future of work. Imagine, let's, let's make it dramatic. So tomorrow, bots and uh, robots can code better than any machine learning expert or developer in the world. Tomorrow, uh, robots are going to cook for you better than yourself. Tomorrow, robots are going to, you know, uh, deliver you a pizza, gonna you know drive your car, gonna do anything better than you. So what happens to humanity? The only thing that it keeps us going further is working more and more on our soft skills, and actually going maybe. Um, I mean, the vision that I have personally is to explore the universe, so we can actually augment ourselves and explore more. So that changes the the jobs. It doesn't matter we're losing jobs, you know, for the hamburger stepping or something. I think something drastic would have to happen, like that we could turn into cyborgs, which raises <laughs> an interesting question. If some people have access to that technology and others don't. That counts with two ethic points, yeah. So, so let's uh, open up the questions uh, to the audience um, since we have a few more minutes. And I knew that AI topic is going to kick off the Q&A in Slido. And the first question is going to be from Kurtz. I think this, is pers this person should be from Latvia to shout out all the Latvians out there. And the question is, guys, 
We were told silicon chips will replace human brains. They reach their limit pretty fast. AI now promises a lot. Where is the limit? And what is going to be next? <laughs> Thank you, Gertz. Yeah. We're so far to actually having chips in the brain, actually. So I don't know if you have heard about the super intelligence book by Nick Bostrom. So he explains a lot about what is the paths, different paths to become a super intelligent. So working with brain and having chips and memory chips or like have, scanning your brain and implementing it in another body, it's so far and it's so difficult to do it. A lot of problems, um, like um, but basically uh, scanning the maps, scanning memory, there are stuff that we don't know how to do it today, but I don't say never, never happens. So it, it, it is always possible. So science fiction has actually been born for humans to, to advance in technology. So today now we can fly um, at some certain levels. Today we can, uh, I, come, I came across this company called thedangerousthings.com. You just check it out. It's so freaking out. The company doesn't have any uh, like, you know, address or no phone number, and they are turning you into cybers. So they started with um, like devices with hands, the IoTs, and you can become like a you know, Wolverine. And <laughs> if you check out their products, you're going to freak out. But today, they are you know, using that. Um, uh, the, you, you, have, you have people who are basically feeling earthquakes um, on their body everywhere in the world. Um, there is somebody called Nails. He, he's been born without um, um, seeing color in his life. So he has implemented some antenna, and he sees that he hears colors. So basically, for him, painting is a symphony of uh, like Beethoven. The, the, these things are happening. It's advancing, but I'm not sure about the brain imp implant. Well, it's important to remember that machines have already surpassed humans in very many aspects. And also to be humble in that humans are very good at throwing rocks out in the savanna. That's pretty much what we're good at. And also running and sweating. And so I don't think anybody here imagines that they're very good at intuiting how Lorentz contraction works or how the distributions of quantum effects go. But that's child's play to computers. So right now, the big challenge is to reverse engineer the evolution that has happened in our brains. And that's, that's difficult. But to ask when machines will surpass humans, well, it's already happened. Yeah, absolutely. But in, in only in certain tasks. So, <coughs> in, so, in not so, pretending to be human. Yeah, so that's where we go in the, into the fact that um, what, what's the limit of AI? Mm. So in my mind, the limit of AI is only limited by the data and the processing power. And our understanding of ourselves. And our understanding of universe, basically. There's something also, too. It's about uh, self-consciousness. <coughs> so for the first time, actually, the scientists could develop a robot, which looks like a spider, and it has self-consciousness, meaning that it understands that it exists. They, they did this uh, test, and it caught one of the feet, and they developed a way to understand. So now he, he, it has only three feet, for example. So robots, for example, Sophia or whoever else, they don't know that they exist. But there will be this little moment that the robots understand, OK, they are actually some, some existence. So that's actually a very critical point, I, I do believe. Any other questions from the audience? And we still have time for one question. We'll test if the catch box works this time. So raise your hands. Who is very eager to ask uh, this fascinating panelist question related to AI? Yay! Sure. Try your luck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucas. Um, so we're clearly going to be iterating a lot on the ethics and the social boundary conditions. Are there any kind of framework things that we should get right so that even if the specific rules and the norms change, we kind of are within the right guide frames? Is that some kind of rules on transparency? Um, you know, basic, you know, the GDPR says something about automated decision making and profiling. Like if you could pick one, two or three kind of framework rules that let you have flexibility, but also make sure that we're iterating in the right direction, what would you pick? So uh, I, I can start and then have, uh, pass it over. So uh, one of the things that we discussed uh, with all the students at UC Berkeley is actually if you take all the privacy statements and term of use, it's actually very confusing. So there was actually a student project that actually looked at all the term of uses of all the major applications and the, the consumers don't know when they're updated. Largely, the legal language is confusing. So, you know, simple suggestion is you don't really need regulation to do that, but how, do, how about we start writing term of use that's actually understandable by people? 
um, you know, who every everyone, right? Not just the tech savvy audience here. Um, you know, right now the term we use is three pages long, and people really don't understand, you know, certain things. And when you give authorization to another app, there may be a pop up, but then it's also, you know, required to scroll and so forth. So how do you, you know, actually simplify that and uh, write that in everyday layman language for everybody to understand? Yeah, and I, I would say, say in addition to that, make that sort of uh, understandable uh, terms, make them transparent as well. So you need to understand what your data is being used for, so that it doesn't get used to, I don't know, sway an election or you know, sell you more things if you don't want that. I don't have an answer. I, I would say that we have to be ready to learn things the hard way. That's also it true. could be that way. That's also true. Um, there is all. There are so many uh, frameworks that have been um, launched over the past years, and you see the uh, the rise of a lot of, lot of frameworks into ethics. Like, if you've heard probably from uh, IEEE and all this stuff. So every year, every six months, and now it's getting even faster. More frameworks are arising. So, for example, one of the first first frameworks and rules of, for example, for robots is how do you say a, a robot is, eth is ethical, its applications? So the first thing, for example, that person who's using it should know that's not a human. The second is a robot never should harm a, wo uh, harm a human. And the third, I don't remember it. <laughs> but yeah, they're the updating every day with every, every um, advance in technologies. So for me, there is no particular framework that actually fits the development of AI, because I don't think that the development of AI is a linear process, it's a non-linear process, which means that we don't know what is coming to uh, to use Rumsfeld's words, we don't know what we don't know. So there's only one basic thing that has been the same for the last 30 years, believe it or not, that still applies, don't do evil. <laughs> and then the last point I will add is, uh, you know, back to Mujan's point about education and a lot of the work you actually do with clients. So even if you have, you know, regulation, uh, there is a huge, I, I believe, a huge gap that still exists between people who actually implement, who are frontline with the consumer, and for example, the chief compliance officer. Mm. Um, when you go into large companies that are, have the desire to implement AI applications, the kind of education, I'm sure you have experienced this, when you talk to a chief compliance officer, to a CTO, to a chief product person, to head of sales, quite different. Um, and that gap um, can't be bridged by, you know, let's just hand out regulation because all these things that we're building and, pe you know, pe built by the folks in this room impact how we live and, you know, how, how we do things. And so that gap um, is still quite big even though, I mean, I don't know how many years we'll be in the AI journey. I th that's a great, great experiment. Ask those different people what they think it means for data to be anonymized and you'll get different answers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce and panelists, for this interesting.